The Supreme Court is now in session. The Honorable F. Philip Carbolito, Chief Justice presiding. Thank you, uh, Madam Clerk. Uh, good morning, councils. And will the clerk please call the case? This is Supreme Court case number CRA 20-009, People of Guam, Plaintiff Appellee versus Eric Juan Palacios Kitigua, Defendant Appellant. Appearing for the Defendant Appellant is Attorney M. Heather M. Zona. Appearing for the Plaintiff Appellee is Attorney Jeremiah Luther. The panel consists of Chief Justice F. Philip Carbolito, Associate Justice Robert J. Torres, and Associate Justice Catherine A. Merriman. Attorney Zona reserves how many minutes? Seven minutes. Thank Seven you. minutes. And Attorney Luther has 15 minutes to, to argue. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Um, Attorney Zona, uh, you are recognized and you may proceed. Thank you. Mr. Chief Justice, Justice Torres, Justice Merriman, may it please the court. This interlocutory appeal addresses whether Mr. Kitigua, as an indigent defendant, may apply to the trial court for expert assistance, ex parte, under seal, without notice to the prosecution and general public, and without revealing his defense strategies. Or, as the trial court found, Mr. Kitigua must first reveal his work product in the form of defense strategies to the prosecution and public at large in order to seek the tools for an adequate defense. We seek the following relief. First, a determination that an indigent defendant is not required to disclose his defense strategies to the prosecution and the general public in order to, to secure the constitutional guarantee to an adequate defense. And second, a determination that an indigent defendant may apply to the court for expert assistance ex parte, under seal, and without notice to the prosecution and the general public. The legal issue here is a narrow one, but one that implicates many areas of law, including constitutional rights, statutory rights, ethical obligations, and work product. And these issues are present in every case involving an indigent defendant. So the court's guidance on the issue here will provide clarification for all cases involving indigent defendants. It will avoid inconsistent results. And most importantly, it will protect the accused constitutional guarantees and his rights under Guam law. Now, with respect to the trial court order, the Superior Court found Mr. Kitigua indigent, and that was made pursuant to Superior Court Rule MR 1.1. So Mr. Kitigua's indigence is not at issue here, and it never was at issue once the court made that finding. But because Mr. Kitigua is indigent, he has to apply to the Superior Court for financial assistance to secure expert assistance. And he also has to explain why that's necessary. Um, and that's under the rule MR 1.1.4. So Mr. Kitigua did apply to the trial court ex parte under seal and without notice of the prosecution. And in accordance with rule CBR 7, Point one one, Mr. Kitigua submitted a declaration explaining why notice of the application was not provided to the prosecution. And specifically, the reasons were number one, to avoid broadcasting his defense strategies. Number two, to avoid violating his due process and equal protection rights by conditioning receipt of the tools for an adequate defense on disclosure of his legal strategies. And number three, because permitting the prosecution to weigh in on his defense strategies and tactics in the form of seeking expert assistance would undermine both the attorney-client privilege as well as Mr. Kitigua's right to effective assistance of counsel pursuant to the Sixth Amendment. Mr. Kitigua further requested that any order and offers of proof in connection with the request be made ex parte and that they be filed under seal to afford him that same protection. The Ms. trial Ms. Court yeah. Can, can I ask a question here? Um, yes. It, it seems that the the prosecution has conceded that 
uh, a request for an ex parte hearing to raise the substantive issues uh, before the trial court in camera regarding the necessity of an expert uh, in a particular case seems appropriate. Uh, but they argue that the mere act of noticing them that you're going forward with uh, such a request doesn't fall within the protections of the work product doctrine. And they um, ask that we look at uh, Georgia law where there's notice a public, you know, generally a notice, a public filing of a notice about the request without any you know, details, I guess, concerning the uh, particular expert that's going to be uh, sought and the reasons for it, et cetera. Um, and uh, just that the amount of the, and the amount of the funding that's going to be required uh, to hire that expert. But you think that's still protected within the work product doctrine? I do, and I'll tell you why, for a couple of reasons. Number one, there may very well be cases where simply uh, the fact that somebody is seeking expert assistance reveals quite a bit in terms of strategy or weaknesses in case or, or whatnot uh, that pertains to it. Um, number two, I do think that the act of seeking, uh, deciding whether to seek expert assistance does fall within work product because it does reveal um, a path that a that a, a defense may move along. So how, um, how does that uh, prejudice um, a defendant? Uh, you 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 make the general comment that just uh, giving notice uh, that the defendant is seeking an expert um, in some way divulges some type of strategy. Um, but you know when a person pleads not guilty by reason of um, mental illness, for example, and and seeking a, 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 psychi a psychiatrist expert. How is uh, the mirror? I, I don't know what was the plea here. I plead. I assume is just not guilty. But um, how does just giving notice that um, the defendant is seeking an expert, and and maybe without even divulging uh, the type of expert that is being sought, uh, prejudice the defendant or assist the government? Well, there are different types of cases and experts can be sought in all kinds of different areas. So in some, and, and we'll concede that there are instances where it's quite obvious. I mean, there, you know, I've been involved in a number of cases where it's very clear the government uh, has a DNA expert and I'm going to get my own DNA expert. But there may be other instances where um, there's just simply the disclosure of of the fact that there's an expert can reveal to the prosecution that there may be uh, an issue that, that the prosecution may very well not have thought about, may very well not have uh, pursued, or may not recognize that there's a particular- You're, you're asking <laughs> us to do just a blanket rule. Uh, in all instances, uh, uh, the defendant uh, doesn't matter what type of expert, whether it's a fingerprint expert, a psych psychiatrist expert, that the, that the defendant not have to provide notice in a request for an ex party hearing. For an That's appointment. exactly right. Yes, and Your so, Honor. So, let me just finish here. Oh, and I'm so, sorry. you know, just saying generally um, that there may be uh, um, conveying, let's, let's give me an example. I mean, if a defendant uh, pleads not guilty by reason of mental illness, uh, decides that uh, uh, he or she wants to then uh, seek an expert uh, witness, um, how would that, and if we have a blanket rule, how would giving notice to the government prejudice your client or the defendant well, in the hypothetical? Well, if a not, not guilty for reason of mental illness, I mean, I think that that is perhaps not the, the best example for what I'm looking for, because in that instance, I think it's clear to everyone that we would need psychiatric uh, expert assistance on, on both sides. And I would imagine the, the I, court- I use that example yeah. as the first instance because you're asking us to do no exception across the board that you not be provided, uh, that the government not be provided notice. So let's use a different hypothetical and that defendant just pleads not guilty. And so how right. does, uh, how does uh, noticing that um, the defendant is seeking an expert witness um, prejudice the defendant? Well, I'll give the reasons of why you're asking for an expert. 
Absolutely. So um, I would also clarify that what we've said in our briefing is that it's actually up to the defendant and the defendant's counsel to decide when to provide that notice. So it wouldn't preclude uh, in a situation, as, as your honor pointed out, where there's not guilty by reason of insanity, that, that wouldn't preclude the defendant from providing that notice. And certainly there are instances where uh, a trial court judge would would say, okay, counsel, this is the issue. I want you to disclose your expert by this date, this expert by the other date. Um, we could have a situation, for example, perhaps there is a um, blood splatter analysis. Uh, maybe there are no experts uh, needed for perhaps uh, a, a case, but it's very clear that there's blood splatter and, and maybe the prosecution hasn't thought about that. And so providing notice that we're going to actually be looking at that, that, that could in fact key up for the prosecution, um, the fact that there is that issue. But more importantly, the, the other issue in terms of prejudice could come out at trial. So for example, even in an instance where, for example, uh, DNA were an issue and the um, prosecution clearly will have a DNA expert and the defense might not necessarily uh, want to uh, disclose right away that there's a DNA uh, expert at trial by notifying uh, that there will be an expert sought. Um, I, I could, and I, I'm just using this as, as an example. I could talk to my DNA expert. The prosecution would know that I would have identified an expert, but they can probably figure out based on the facts. And then I don't call that expert at trial. So I would not, not want to have a situation where then at trial, the prosecution is able to argue, well, hey, they sought expert assistance. Where's their expert? Their expert isn't even here. And therefore you should side with us. That's an advantage that they would get that would prejudice my client that they would not necessarily have if they didn't know that there was an expert being sought. And this is, by the way, the um, process in California, um, you know, where I have practiced, we always would file our requests uh, ex parte and under seal, except in a case, uh, for example, where um, NGRI uh, is an issue for exactly that reason. So again, it's not, um, it's not precluding uh, notice to be given to the prosecution in an appropriate case. But I think that to say that there needs to be notice in every case sort of is, is backwards because it does no, no, create no, the- so, I, so do we follow the jurisdiction that leaves it to the discretionary of the trial judge uh, to determine uh, whether or not notice should be given or not, or or an ex party whether an, uh, the ex it should be an ex party hearing or not. I think that with respect to the notice, uh, the judge at the end of the day has has the ultimate authority to to run the case. Um, but I would say that in the first instance, it would be up to the defendant as to whether that notice should be given for those reasons that I just articulated. And the Georgia um, decision, the Brooks case, I believe it is that the, the prosecution cited, actually um, that relied a lot on the fact that whether the, the client's indigence was an issue. So the, the prosecution's arguments um, Based, are based on cases that say, well, they should have noticed because they need to make sure that the client truly is indigent. But that was actually rejected in another case, the Moody case that was cited by the prosecutor. Well, what about the instance where um, the trial court disallowed the ex parte hearing um, without notice, but um, during the ex parte hearing uh, determines that it would be helpful for the government to weigh in. If um, the government was not given prior notice of at least an expert was um, being sought, then wouldn't that just add to additional uh, pretrial delay and having to then notify the government, uh, the, the government having to be given the time to, to respond to the judge's questions. Whereas if the 
government was provided notice uh, without the reasons or which expert is being sought, uh, then the government at least can provide, based on its knowledge of the facts of the case, any information uh, to the trial court uh, at an ex parte hearing in a written filing, um, information that may be helpful in arriving at a decision. Well, Your Honor, I, that question gives me some pause because I think just from a constitutional perspective, I don't think that the government should be weighing in on uh, whether an indigent defendant receives expert assistance. I, well, I think uh, that in order to do that, they would have to be um, weighing in on, I mean, I mean because the, the defendant already is required to justify to the trial court why the expert is necessary. And then to have at that hearing, the prosecution weigh in as to whether that uh, expert truly is necessary, I think, uh, you know, is, a, is really a nullification of the accused's constitutional rights. Um, because- If we uh, follow the Arizona courts and several other uh, jurisdictions, um, they've already um, taken the position that there's no constitutional and in their case, statutory uh, right uh, for a, a defendant to be entitled to an ex parte hearing uh, when it is seeking uh, expert an expert witness at government expense. Well, Your Honor, I, I would disagree with those uh, cases. I mean, if it's a statutory issue uh, that still does not address the constitutional issue. So the defendant may not have that right based on a statute, which quite honestly, I would question the constitutionality of that, uh, but the defendant still would have a right under the constitution, the United well, States. Arizona, the Arizona Supreme Court didn't believe that to be the case. And, and, and as Justice Carbonito ruled, they, they said there was no constitutional right to a ex parte hearing on the necessity uh, of an expert. But if, I mean, you know, the situation may be different as of course, where indigency has already been established and where indigency has not been established. So in the process of making a claim for an expert witness, if part of that same motion, you're trying to assert that the defendant is indigent um, and entitled to, uh, and hasn't qualified and yet, and is they're requiring the court to make a determination on that. I mean, one would expect maybe that bright defense counsel like yourself might bifurcate that motion, but if, what happens if, a, if they come in and they don't? Um, I, I mean, are you suggesting that the, the state can't make an argument about qualification or shouldn't be entitled to prove that the person is secreting assets and not showing a full representation of their qualification for representation? Well, no, I think that the, the government always can be present at any determination as to a client's indigency. I, I mean, I, I think that's the, the, I think that's the right. Uh, obviously the, the court has the ultimate ability to decide and determine whether someone is indigent. And I think in Guam, I, I can't speak to Arizona, but I think in Guam, there's a fairly a uh, rigorous process, uh, probation is involved, there are forms that are filed under oath. Um, I think we articulated that. So I, I think the government can always uh, address that, but I, I do think that that is an issue that is separate from uh, whether a, an indigent defendant receives expert assistance. So I, I would think that bifurcating that, I don't, I don't think that, I don't think that they have anything to do with each other in the grand scheme of things, uh, I think indigency is simply a hurdle that the uh, defendant has to pass in order to show that he's eligible for uh, an expert paid for by the court. But it does concern me as well to, to consider having the um, prosecution aware that the indigent defendant is seeking expert assistance because Certainly it doesn't go both ways, right? I mean, we as uh, representatives uh, of indigent defendants uh, in court at council, we have no idea when the prosecution goes and consults with their experts 
Uh, so I would be concerned, and I would imagine the, the prosecution should be concerned too, that if we do end up having a situation where the indigent defendant is required to disclose that and provide notice to the prosecution, I think as a matter of fundamental fairness, then the prosecution would be required to advise us when they consult with experts, retain experts. Um, and I don't think that that is in keeping with uh, work product protection, certainly, uh, but, but also uh, in terms of adequate representation of clients and avoiding prejudicing the clients and, and a whole host of other uh, issues, including uh, just setting up uh, a, a really very troublesome and, and um, thorny issue for courts to decide later on. So, so Ms. Zona, if we were to consider um, the line of cases, the jurisdictions that uh, leave it to the, the discretion of the trial court, that you know they must, uh, the defendant must make a showing as to why uh, notice should not be provided um, to the government, to the people. Uh, what type of standards uh, should we uh, consider? Uh, so that it is not an unfettered discretion, but there needs to be an application of appropriate standards that the trial judge should be guided by in, in making uh, the determination. Do um, you have any suggestions for it? I do. I would say, Your Honor, that at this point, there actually is that ability. Uh, I think that the um, rule CBR 711 does actually articulate uh, the requirement that if somebody is not going to provide notice uh, that that of any motion, really of any motion, that the litigant is obligated to explain why notice shouldn't be provided. So in this instance, I think that, um, you know, if we're trying to shield the fact that we are seeking expert assistance, I think that it is relevant to explain that it goes to a particular defense strategy. And it's a defense strategy that the prosecution is, uh, has no notice of. So this is not an NGRI uh, situation, for example, where everyone is already on notice. However- you, In your pleadings, you, you made those assertions and the trial judge in this case rejected it. So um, do we just say that the trial court was wrong and the, um, the standards of good cause were satisfied and met uh, when uh, the defendant uh, makes these general general assertions that uh, it constitutes a violation of attorney-client privilege, um, work work product violation of um, the work product doctrine, uh, possible self-incrimination, so just those general uh, statements, um, and then the trial court would be bound uh, to uh, withhold uh, any and uh, require any notice be given to the government. Well, yes, Your Honor, because that is with respect to the, the, the actual declaration filed with respect to notice. However, whenever the trial court receives, any trial court receives these materials, it is never simply just the notice. It's also the actual motion that is, that is supposed to be uh, uh, something that articulates very specifically why the expert is necessary. And I think that, um, I mean, this has been my experience in, in many jurisdictions, that, that most trial courts are, are really aware of, of what the issues are in a particular case and can kind of um, make those determinations quite easily as to whether um, something really is necessary and, and certainly whether somebody has made that requisite showing. So you wouldn't object then, as, as if I understand your answer, that that continued to be left to the discretion of the trial court? Well, I think it has to be left to the discretion of the trial court. And I realize I'm eating into my, my time well, here. I, no, it, it doesn't, because there are jurisdictions that say that, no, the defendant is entitled uh, to an ex parte hearing and notice need not be given. The well, no, Your Honor, I, what I was starting to say is that I do think that it's up to the discretion of the trial court as to whether the expert is actually granted. Oh, so I the see. trial court does does look at that and, and has to, to weigh in on that. Um, as to whether notice is given, you know, I 
I don't think that that is within the discretion of the trial court. I think that um, unless the um, defendant uh, specifically agrees uh, or you know, provides notice himself, herself uh, of the request, I, I don't think that the trial court should be uh, disclosing that because I think for the reasons that we've articulated, I think that it's a constitutional violation. I think prejudice is the case. I think it sets up two different standards. I mean, there are many, many, many problems with that. So no, I don't think that that should be left within the discretion of the trial court. All right, if you wish to uh, reserve your remaining time. Yes, thank you. Mr. Luther, um, you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice, Justice Torres, Justice Merriman. May it please the court. The government's position is quite clear on this. We agree with defense counsel that an indigent defendant has the right to keep defense strategy secret from the prosecution and application for funds for an expert. I believe that the case law on this issue is fairly overwhelming. Where the case law differs is whether the disclosure actually produces a harm that must be remedied by awarding a new trial. That's the difference between our argument prior to and our argument before this court now, our argument against the interlocutory appeal. With the interlocutory appeal having been accepted, the people urge this court to adopt the position of multiple courts, state courts, and the federal jurisdiction that a defendant has the right to apply to a court in an ex parte hearing and to have an ex parte hearing uh, free from the influence or an adversarial hearing with prosecution to justify to the court why expert funds are necessary. What the prosecution and the government is asking for is simply notice that that hearing or the application has been made. In that application and notice, we are not asking that the defense counsel reveal trial strategy. We are not asking that defense counsel reveal the motivation behind requesting the expert, the expert's area of expertise, or the person or individual sought to be relied upon against expertise. I want to bring up- What about, issue. What about Ms. Ms. Zona's argument that just the mere disclosure of the fact they sought an expert, even without identifying the subject area or any of the- areas that you suggested you're not asking for uh, would give some advantage to the government and they'd be able to make that argument at trial that they sought an expert and that expert didn't testify. I don't believe that we would have a relevancy ability to make that argument at trial to reference a witness who was consulted by defense counsel but then produced no evidence whatsoever during the course of the trial. Defense counsel may seek the influence of an expert or the information provided by an expert. They do not, that expert, if that expert under the rules of evidence here in Guam produces a report, then we are entitled to that report under the discovery rules under the, um, under title, I believe it's chapter eight of the, uh, of the Guam code. And so, I think that that leads me directly into my next point. Disclosure of strategy pre-trial is not inherently a violation of the attorney-client privilege between a criminal defendant and a criminal defense attorney. We have multiple instances where the law requires a defense attorney to reveal witnesses, defense strategy. Um, uh, if there is a report, the, the prosecution upon motion is entitled to that expert report prior to the trial. And I think that that's essential here because under counsel's approach, this is an all or nothing take it or leave it approach. The people are simply asking that our right and our interest, which has been recognized by the court in Ake and the court in Louisiana in the Touche case and the court again in uh, State v. Bright, I believe in Georgia, that the government has an interest in monitoring the expenditure of taxpayer funds. In, in this, uh, does it make a difference that uh, Ms. Zona points out that uh, the Judicial Council here has responsibility for the indigent defense funds and the Judicial Client Services funds is separate from the government of Guam general fund accounts? 
So what is the interest of the uh, prosecution in, in, in protecting the FISC, so to speak, as you argued, um, when it's the judiciary already who's responsible for that and not the executive branch? In each of the cases that I cited to, the judiciary is administering the funds that counsel says are being administered under a different, the, the source of the, the taxpayer dollars and the way that the taxpayer dollars are doled out doesn't diminish the government's interest in another branch of government doling out taxpayer funds unless the funds are generated independently of taxes, which I'm the judiciary does not have a tax authority in, in and of itself. The legislature and the executive have a right under our separation of powers authority to have some kind of monitoring authority or some interest in how those funds are dealt out, which is why I believe one of the reasons that when counsel applies for uh, indigency, the prosecution is noticed of it right away. We don't have a separate ex parte hearing for an, a, a, every defendant that comes before the Superior Court or the Magistrate's Court, where the magistrate independently interviews that individual to find out whether or not they are entitled to indigent funds. That is put on the record and that goes before the people. And does, that does, public it, matter, does it matter, Mr. Luther, that there are um, inherent restrictions in, in the um, use of these funds? There's a cap of Fifteen hundred dollars uh, um, that can be uh, built uh, towards um, securing an expert witness, and so um, I'm just trying to understand what is it that the government um, can contribute uh, to the judiciary in the interests of um, being uh, vigilant uh, and not um, have taxpayers. Uh, funds being unnecessarily um, wasted. Um, and so what is it that the government, if they're entitled, as you argue, to notice so that uh, the people can make sure that the judiciary is properly um, um, expending uh, these limited taxpayer funds, regardless of the source of how it's raised, um, what insight can you provide to the trial court that the trial court is, may not already be mindful of? The, the insight is the, the notice is the right from what I see under the case law. That the government's interest, while it may not be the most overwhelming interest and, and counsel may not find it a, uh, a, a, a compelling interest, the courts have recognized that the government has an interest in how the taxpayer dollars are spent. And we have to and the government's solution in this case is to thread the needle, so to speak, to balance the interest of the defendant and having his or, or protecting his defense strategy prior to trial. And then also weighing that against the government's interest and in having some kind of notification so that taxpayer funds are not doled out completely in secret. Under defense counsel's argument or appellant counsel's argument, the doling out of every application for an indigent defendant would be secret and it would remain secret even after the trial has concluded how those funds but at least with notice the government is kept at least on the surface in the loop and that we're aware of the numerosity if not the substance of applications for expert counsel how we would proceed if the government found that there was some kind of maybe abuse or excessive application in this case. I think that that's a, an area that we would proceed to and it's an extreme, but it is something that government has an interest in. And I do not believe, and the people have argued in our brief that by allowing us simply notice that an application has been made, not even the outcome of that application or the procedure simply allowing us notice does not violate a defendant's right to keep his defense strategy secret. Um, I think it balances the interest of the government against the defendant. And we submit that that is the proper course that the court should take. It recognizes the government's interest and it recognizes the defense interest. Um, I, I do want to clear what one about issue. What about the uh, uh, public defender's uh, request for equity? if we are going to require them to disclose uh, a retention of, a, of an expert, um, even without the subject area uh, 
the government should be bound by the, the same requirement. And that I, currently the government doesn't, uh, is not burdened by, by that uh, requirement. I, I, I'm glad that you brought that up, Justice Torres, because I, I am honestly a bit confused as to counsel's argument on this point. If I, as a criminal prosecutor, discuss a case with an expert witness or a witness within expertise, my discussion with that expert is subject to discovery under Brady and its progeny. My understanding is that I can't keep that expert discussion a secret. If I go out into the field and I discuss with a witness or I have a witness come into my office and I discuss procedure, I have to document and send to counsel notice that the, that the meeting to discuss procedure, not substantive issues, just procedure with that witness occurred and, and disclose that information to counsel. My understanding is that while there may not be any specific rule in Guam law or under the Guam rules of evidence, Brady and the common law require that I disclose that information to counsel. So I have to, I, I've done this multiple times where I've spoken. Isn't that only if it's exculpatory? If you're, Our if you're for example, the medical examiner boosts your evidence in your case, you don't have to disclose that, do you? I believe if, let's see, um, I assume that if a medical examiner were to issue an autopsy that's advantageous to the prosecution, I believe that failure to turn over the autopsy prior to trial of the report of the, first of all, he would be, that would be an expert report. I believe the rules would require that we disclose that anyway. But let's assume that there is no statutory requirement under Guam law and no Guam rule of evidence that requires no case law. I believe Brady would actually cover the requirement to turn over a, a, a um, medical examiner's report because it could lead to exculpatory evidence under those circumstances. If I have a substantive discussion with an expert outside of the case, um, I have to, I, my belief is that I have to turn that information over under um, US constitution, under, under discovery rules. So whether or not Guam law addresses that, um, so I, I was a little bit confused. I do not believe that a prosecutor has the right to consult with an expert completely ex parte to expend taxpayer funds to receive a report or an evaluation by that expert and then not disclose that information. Let me just, I, I, to, to me, I, I, this is a, a timing issue is the way I'm, I'm seeing it. I mean, it's obvious that, you know, pre-trial when a court has set uh, the time periods in which um, uh, these experts reports um, and have to be provided if they have been intended to be used at trial. But here we have it at the, at, at least as far as um, the defendant in this case, at the juncture pre-trial early on when a determination of how this, uh, uh, how the defendant uh, will probably um, make a decision in reference to the defendant on the case. And so if the government, uh, at the similar instance, if they are just thinking of retaining an expert, uh, is there a requirement uh, just in reference to at that early stage to provide notice to the defendant? Well, if the government is considering, I believe that would be, if the government is simply considering consulting with an expert, I believe that that would be subject to work product discussions and not subject to disclosure under Guam rules. So why However, is that we, different with the defendant? Because the defendant is accessing taxpayer dollars in, and the public defender's office is not subject to the same oversight, legislative and executive oversight that the government of Guam, the prosecution office is subject to. But the, but the government is also retaining the expert at taxpayer expense. If the government retains the expert at taxpayer expense, my understanding is that we have to turn that information over to defense counsel once that information is obtained in the same way that we can't turn over evidence until it is collected. Once we have an expert report on an aspect, it's when our obligation. Does government, to turn over. When does the government retain an expert not at government expense? I don't believe the government can retain an expert um, without a government expense. So I believe in every case where the government, again, goes, goes out to solicit an expert 
and actually retains them outside of the areas such as the medical examiner, which we do not have to retain, but we exert very little control over the medical examiner and the medical examiner's office and the methods by which the medical examiner draws his conclusion. I think that's the best example because that's the most frequent expert that the government um, that the government entertains. We have experts so, with so you can see that after the fact and the, when the government decides um, and does retain that uh, then the government is obligated to provide notice to the defendant. But what about the um, time period when the government is contemplating to um, retain an expert uh, for its own reason? Does the government have to provide notice uh, to the defendant uh, that it is thinking and then wishes to um, retain an expert uh, before actually engaging this expert? I don't believe that the government has any obligation uh, to, to do so, nor does defense counsel have an obligation to notify the government that it is considering seeking expert, an, an expert witness either. However, that's the very case here. That's what Ms. Zona was trying to do is she was trying to seek uh, an expert um, so that uh, that uh, I assume that expert can assist Ms. Zona in determining um, how this uh, trial uh, should be conducted in whatever limited form uh, she is contemplating for that service. And Ms. If Ms. Zona and the, uh, my apologies. I'm done. Thank you. Ms. Ms. Zona and I were on equal footing as representatives of a, of a governmental entity, I would concede the point. However, Ms. Zona's public defender service and the alternate public defender are semi-autonomous bodies that are not subject to the same internal oversight that the government, the government is. If I seek to retain an expert outside of the normal expertise, let's say outside of the medical examiner, let's say outside of the um, a forensic analysis or a firearms analyst that is, is already on the government payroll with GovGuam, my application has to go through several different levels of bureaucracy and be reviewed by those bureaucrats prior to the release of funds sufficient to retain that expert. And I, while this is not a very exciting argument to make, that is the same level of scrutiny. Actually, it's, it's a higher level of scrutiny than what the people are requesting in this case in regards to Ms. Zona and, and her client is that counsel simply notice the government that the request has been made so that other entities of the government or so that the executive branch is aware that taxpayer dollars are being sought. I don't think that that gives us any right to object unless there are extreme circumstances, but the notice is what the government is seeking, not the substance, just the notice. And that notice will allow the government a measure of oversight in an otherwise well, I, I hesitate to say black hole, but or or secret chamber, but those are the circumstances that the government is is concerned with, and I am representing the government's fiscal interest in this aspect. Thank you, Attorney Luther. I think you've exhausted. May I ask? I have two questions. Yeah, go ahead, just Mary. Uh, the a public defender and the alternate public defender have investigators on staff that are paid for by the government. So they're in some sense have an advantage um, to starting a case and, and trying to come up with a strategy over a private attorney from the attorney defense panels. Doesn't it disadvantage a defendant who has a private attorney who has to come to the court to get money for an expert, whereas maybe the public defender and alternate public defender do not. So if a private attorney comes to the court and says, I need a fingerprint expert uh, because I want, may want to challenge the fingerprints, but I need someone to tell me if they can be challenged, uh, doesn't that disadvantage unfairly? those to indigent defenders? If I, Justice Merriman, if I understand your question, I don't wanna take up too much time. The question is rooted in whether or not 
what access to fairness money grants an indigent defendant in those certain circumstances, the way that I understand it, and I'm, maybe I am not understanding your question, question correctly. Um, I would rephrase the question as whether or not the disadvantage in those, in those disparate circumstances, or those differing circumstances actually leads to real prejudice to the defendant. Because I think that in any criminal case, whether a defendant has a private attorney or whether the defendant is given a, a public defender, in each I'm of those cases- of, I'm speaking of court-appointed private counsel. Because court-appointed- conflict with the public defender. So we have an indigent defendant with- uh, I understand counsel. your question now. Um, again, the people's position would be that notice of the request does not prejudice the defendant sufficient that he is deprived of a fair trial or that compromises attorney-client privilege to the extent that the defendant cannot have the free communication with his attorney that the law is designed to give him. In those circumstances, in your situation where a court appointed attorney has to apply for services for an investigator, um, I would find it confusing as to why um, a court appointed attorney who does not have an investigator all, already on staff would believe that the application for an investigator, which I wouldn't expect that attorney to have in the first place, I think under uh, appellant counsel's approach, that, would, that application would need to be in secret as well. Um, I don't, I cannot see the prejudice to defendant such that it would deprive him of a fair trial or that it would violate attorney client privilege in light of the other disclosures that the law requires defense counsel to make already. To me, the revealing of potential witnesses and an expert report, very few but substantive disclosures that the law requires defense counsel to make are far more revealing of trial strategy. And these are, again, before trial. Disclosures that a defense counsel is required to make are far more revealing of trial strategy. And our courts have sustained that that is not a violation of defendant's rights. My other question is, an attorney, a defense attorney, has the obligation to meet the discovery requirements. Uh, if they decide they're gonna use the expert, but shouldn't they have the right if the expert's advice is uh, the fingerprints are, are clearly the defendants or the DNA results can't be challenged, they've been done properly, uh, the results are, are foolproof. Doesn't the defense counsel have a right to retain that information without disclosing it to the government? Meaning that the government shouldn't even be in notice or even thinking of those options. As a prosecutor, I'm not sure how I would be aware that the defense counsel has what the results of any expert analysis would be if defense counsel does not turn that information over to me. So if defense counsel doesn't reveal the identity of a defendant either through statutory discovery rules or because they simply do not wish to use the expert witness at trial or the report of the expert witness at trial that the information disclosed, then I'm not entitled to that information. And under the government's proposal before the court today, I still wouldn't be entitled to that information. Simply notice that an application for a witness had been made in the past at some point during the pretrial procedures. That's the only notice that I would have under the government's proposal. But I, I, I again, defense counsel and I are not very far away on this belief that defense counsel is not required to disclose the strategy behind the application for an expert witness the people believe that the government's interest, which I am bound to represent, is simply to notice that an application has been made so that we can monitor in some form or fashion the, exp the, the, the dispensation of, of taxpayer-derived funds. And, and, you, and don't, so, you don't trust the judges to do that? Your Honor, it is, I think, a, a principle of our uh, three-part governmental democracy system that the executive branch 
checks the judiciary, the judiciary checks the legislative and the executive. And so while uh, I may not have a specific example where I don't, I, I can point to a, a court or a judicial officer where I don't trust them in the expiration or the dispensation of funds, that doesn't mean that we won't have that situation in the future. And it doesn't, um, it doesn't negate the executive branch's obligation to monitor the dispensation of taxpayer dollars. Thank you, no further questions. Thank you, Justice. Thank you, um, Assistant Attorney General Luther. Um, um, Ms. Zoni, you can, you are recognized to use your remaining rebuttal time. Hey, Your Honor, I just wanted to make a couple of points in response. Um, number one, uh, just to disabuse any confusion, um, we are not, uh, no party is required to disclose uh, expert information reports, et cetera, if they're not going to use it at trial. That, that's a standard uh, provision in any civil case. And it's certainly the case here in, in the criminal case. And in fact- Ms. Under Zona, what about, what about Title VIII uh, of the Guam Criminal Procedure Code? Um, specifically, let me just grab the section. Um, that references the uh, government's disclosure of expert witnesses. It's in uh, chapter 70, uh, and it talks about the, the <clears throat> prosecutor's obligation, and it's 70.10A3, to report any report or statement of an expert made in connection of that case. And it doesn't have the same requirement that the defendant uh, has where it's based on the, uh, for the defendant's obligation under that provision, it's where he intends to use it at trial. That standard is, doesn't seem to be present in that obligation under, our, uh, under the rules of discovery. Yes, and in the, in the criminal, in the, in, and I'm sorry, I, I do wanna clarify. So in the civil case, that's exactly what happens. And I think that's very standard. In the criminal case, we have a different situation because it is not. Um, this is a, this is the criminal equal. code of procedure. That that's right, Your Honor. And I'm looking right. at um, section seventy twenty five eight GCA seventy twenty five, and it actually only requires the defendant to disclose experts, uh, you know, results of physical that, and mental examinations, if the defense attorney intends to use it at trial. So to Correct. The but, but for the prosecutor, if you look at the prosecutor's obligations under 70.10 A3, it is not subject to that same standard of what they intend to use at trial. That's exactly right, because in a criminal case, the prosecution has the burden of proof. The defendant has the right to present a defense, but the defendant is not required to present a defense. And the reason for that is because the government always has the burden of proving the case beyond a reasonable doubt. I mean, in a criminal case, in theory, uh, a, a defendant could simply sit at counsel table and do nothing and say nothing. And I, I believe that may even have been but I, I thought your argument no. was that the, gov the prosecution didn't have a duty to deliver an expert report unless they intended to use it at trial. And I was just pointing out that that's not my understanding of their discovery obligations under our code. That's right, Your Honor. And I'm sorry, I did want to clarify that I was talking about initially civil cases. Uh, and, I, and I'm sorry if I misspoke on that. So in any event, the defendant doesn't have the obligation to, to reveal anything with respect to expert uh, opinions, et cetera, unless the defendant is going to use that material at trial. And at that point, yes, of course, certainly uh, we, would, we would produce that um, and, and that's discoverable. But again, it has to be on notice motion of the prosecution. So the prosecutor has to actually file a motion in order to be uh, entitled, entitled to that. So I just wanna make, Make sure we're on the and same. And the same board. is true for defense counsel under 70.10. They have to, uh, I believe, uh, upon notice motion by the defendant, give uh, the prosecution has the same obligation. That is correct, Your Honor. 
So th there is a statutory framework for this. And I think that when we're looking at 7025, uh, I think that we, we have to conclude that the legislature is, is looking at this from a work product perspective because otherwise, and also recognizing the nature of a criminal case, which is very different from a civil case. So that is my first point. The second thing is that with respect to the notice uh, issue and why the prosecution feels it's entitled to notice, the chief reason, the only reason that, I, that I've heard is that the prosecution wants notice to be able to somehow monitor the expenditure by the, the judiciary. And I would point out, number one, simply receiving notice without any other information doesn't actually allow the prosecution to know the specifics of the money or, or whatnot. Um, so I don't even think that what they're seeking accomplishes what they are trying to accomplish. But, but what about two, if it was the fifth? What about if it was the fifth notice for an expert in a particular case? Well, I think that that is up to the trial court, and I think the trial court can simply say to the uh, defendant. Uh, I don't think you need uh, this expert. You haven't shown that this is important. Uh, you know, this is a, a DUI case, and I don't really think that um, fingerprint analysis is appropriate, and I don't think DNA analysis is appropriate. I think the trial court has the ability to do that. That is the mechanism that is already in place and that is already contemplated. The notice requirement that the prosecution is, is urging uh, is supposedly related to monitoring uh, expenditure of money, but we already have a mechanism in place to monitor these expenditures. And I think that the judiciary uh, you know, you know, ha has a limit, it has a cap. The, the, ju the trial ju judge can say even to someone, um, I, I, I think that this, you know, it, merits that amount of money or doesn't, or also the defendant can come in and say, I need an expert. And I think the expert will cost $200 so, and the judge can grant that too. I, I understand that, you know, the government has not articulated the strongest reason why um, they um, are entitled to notice, but at the same token, what is the prejudice to the defendant in simply providing notice without anything more? Well, I think we've articulated that the fact that somebody is seeking is seeking an expert is in and of itself work product. And depending on the particular case, that can uh, reveal a particular defense strategy because it may be very obvious to the prosecution. And I think the other prejudice is that the prosecution- it, Give me an example. Her. Give me an example that I can wrap my hands around of that, um, Ms. Zona, where okay. simply the disclosure without identifying any of the details regarding the expert would tip the hand to the prosecutor. So I think, uh, for example, um, in case I was familiar with in California, blood splatter analysis. Um, in a case where there really wasn't, uh, the, the parties kind of agreed based on the discovery. Uh, I mean, I think they would have agreed. We didn't actually chat about it, but that there really wasn't any other um, issue, but the blood splatter analysis was an issue. And um, the prosecution actually had a fairly strong case, could have a strong case, but that one area could have been an, an issue. And so by virtue of the defendant articulating, providing notice that he was going to seek an, an expert, it would have been fairly clear to the prosecution that an expert was being sought on a particular issue. And the prosecution uh, can essentially wait and see whether the, the defendant is going to pursue an expert. And then the prosecution can then in response uh, go out and get its own expert, but essentially but how, it's kind of letting. But how would they? How would the prosecution know whether it was going to be uh, blood splatter, whether it was going to be gun residue, whether it was going to be you know matching the the bullet to the firearm, whether it was going to be 
a mental expert on, on his state of mind at the time that uh, he discharged the firearm. I mean, there seems to be a plethora of possibilities that uh, that expert could have testified to in this particular case. Well, that's possible, but it is also possible that in a case such as the one that I'm, I'm mentioning, where everybody kind of acknowledged that there wasn't a need for a, a ballistics expert, for example, or firearms or uh, DNA or anything, that really the only you know, thing uh, that was kind of a potential avenue for the defendant was blood splatter analysis. So that would key the prosecution in, for example, in that particular example, to that area. And so the prosecution would essentially have noticed that the defendant is moving in a, in a direction um, and could seek its own expert. Or you could also think about it just in a general case where um, the prosecution isn't planning on calling any experts then finds out that the, the defendant is seeking expert testimony in one area, and then the prosecution goes out and finds experts in every single area uh, because it wants to make sure that it's able to address any expert issue. And uh, that's a problem. And then I also did raise the issue about the prosecution being able to say, uh, you know, in argument at trial, uh, well, they consulted with an expert, but where is the expert? The expert's not here. You know, we only have our expert. Um, and I think that that's highly prejudicial. So the, those are the issues. You know, it, I, I do think that there is prejudice. And I don't think that the criminal division of the attorney general's office really has within its mandate overseeing uh, the way in which the judiciary uh, spends its funds. Um, and again, the public defender, the alternate public defender, our status, uh, we, I believe are under, it may be changing, but I believe our funding anyway, the alternate public defender comes through the judiciary as well. Um, I think the judiciary has, has procedures in place. And I think that with respect to the particular fund that's at issue here, it's very clear how that's managed. And I think there is oversight. And I don't think that that oversight is a task to the criminal division of the Office of the Attorney General any more than uh, any other taxpayer in Guam. So, and I realize I'm over, so I'm sorry. I just wanna correct for the record that the APD uh, gets its funding directly from an appropriation from the legislature. But that was the case two years ago and prior. Thank you, councils. Um, we appreciate uh, the arguments. Um, it's been very informative. Uh, the court will take the case under advisement and uh, we stand adjourned.